Thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> so, uh, good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues, students, and friends. Uh, I'm Professor Dyer Reddy. I'm the Vice Chancellor at the University of Cape Town, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this inaugural lecture featuring Professor Susan Cleary, uh, who is the head of the School of Public Health in the Faculty of Health Sciences. Um, she will be speaking to us about bending the arc towards health equity. I'd like to welcome in particular members of Professor Cleary's family. Wonderful to have you here with us. Uh, allow me to introduce the platform party for this evening's event. Uh, on my right, we have Professor Edina Sinanovic, who is the head of the Health Economics Division in the School of Public Health, and she will shortly introduce our speaker. <clears throat> then we have uh, Professor Cleary herself, um, Professor Emerita Guy McIntyre on her right, who is the Executive Director of the International Health Economics Association and she will offer the vote of thanks. And Associate Professor Lionel Green-Thompson, the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, will deliver the closing remarks. So uh, colleagues and friends, inaugural lectures are a very special event in the life of the university. They mark the ascent to full professorship, which is the highest rank to which um, any serious academic might aspire. Um, Appointment to the rank or promotion, either way, constitutes recognition of the stature of a person as a scholar of repute. Um, we recognize the high impact and the quality of their academic work um, in this way. The, the process to with becoming a professor, again, whether via our promotions procedures or via appointment, either way, is an extremely arduous one, I can tell you that. The, the criteria are quite demanding, and so the rank is all the more prized. Coming to the lecture, uh, in order of lectures uh, provide for us an opportunity to celebrate the achievement of the lecture. They also importantly provide an opportunity for the order of lecturer to share insights into his or her scholarly work in a way, in a manner that would be accessible to a broad audience, uh, and to tell us something of what they profess. So by, in this way, by increasing our understanding of Professor Cleary's work in public health, we also build our own understanding of the many hurdles uh, to providing equitable health care in this country. Last month, uh, Daily Maverick reported, and I quote, health facilities countrywide have been adversely affected by austerity measures, which have led to vacant posts not being filled, mental health issues among healthcare workers, and dire funding constraints, and, and, uh, end quote. Yet another analysis published last month in the Mail and Guardian reports that while more than 84% of the population relies on public health care, the accessibility and quality, uh, accessibility to and the quality of services have shown very little improvement in our 30 years of democracy. <clears throat> Again, I quote, it remains almost impossible for many of those living in rural areas, for example, to access high quality health care facilities and to walk through almost any uh, public hospital in the country would horrify those in the private sector." Unquote. So the kinds of questions that these reports raise have fueled Professor Cleary's outstanding work throughout her career. So what does health equity mean? How can we measure it? And most importantly, how can we achieve greater levels of equity, of health equity, given the devastating levels of income and other forms of inequality in this country. As a leader in health economics research and teaching, Susan Cleary offers us an insider's view of these, question, uh, of these questions, focusing on successes such as those in the early days of HIV treatment, 
the challenges we face in the areas of universal health coverage and national health insurance and her vision uh, towards health equity in this stage of her career. Uh, with that, uh, it gives me pleasure now to hand over the podium to Professor Sinanovic, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and a warm welcome to this special event. Professor Sutier's inaugural lecture. Special welcome to Sue's family, her mom Sandra, husband Lance, and daughter Isabella. <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce Sue today, a dear colleague of mine for over 20 years. After completing a BA in Economics and English Literature at Rhodes University, Sue came to the University of Cape Town to do a BA Honours in Economics, followed by an MA in Economics and a PhD in Health Economics. Sue began her career in academia in 2001 when she joined the Health Economics Unit as an entry-level lecturer. She then went on to become a professor in 20. Sue has served as the director of the Health Economics Unit and is currently the head of School of Public Health. So she has been a model citizen of the university. Sue's area of expertise lies in the discipline of health economics, with a special focus on healthcare priority setting and universal health coverage. This includes conducting economic evaluations of various healthcare interventions, as well as analyzing the governance of health technology assessment and related priority setting processes. Over the past two decades, Sue's research focused on developing the evidence base regarding the relative value of alternative investments, the work that enables progress on equity and access to healthcare. Sue is an experienced and innovative, innovative teacher. She's made important contributions to education across all modes, face-to-face, -face, online, mixed mode. Over the years, she has played a key role in the introduction of health economics teaching at the university including at the postgraduate diploma, masters, and PhD levels. Her willingness to contribute her expertise in decision modeling for economic, health economic evaluation to our teaching programs has been invaluable. Sue has supervised many PhD and master's students. She is in extremely high demand as a supervisor of PhD thesis. Sue has played many leadership and management roles at faculty, department, and division levels, with the most recent one being her leadership as the head of the School of Public Health. Sue is passionate about social responsiveness and has pursued various activities that enable progress towards universal health coverage. To name a few, she has made input on the proposed national health insurance reform provided technical support to National Treasury, assisted the National Department of Health with institutionalizing economic evaluation within health technology assessment processes. Sue's contribution to policy development and implementation that particularly stands out is her research on equity and efficiency in health and healthcare for achieving positive results. She conducted the first economic evaluation of antiretroviral treatment based on a public sector pilot program in Southern Africa. This evidence played a role in enabling access to publicly funded antiretroviral treatment in South Africa by providing the first evidence on the cost and cost effectiveness of care, challenging government on their stated reluctance to provide ART based on, based on unaffordability. So following the success of this research, Sue was appointed as co-chair for the economics component of the South Africa's National Strategic Plan on HIV, STI, AIDS and STIs in 2007, and then as chair of the 2012 to 2016 plan. The costing work enabled the budget for the HIV AIDS conditional grant to be estimated during this period, thereby securing the scaling up of ART. So in summary, Sue's career 
represents what UCT expects of its leading academics. Significant contribution to education, strong research and, and the related outputs, leadership role at various levels, and external contribution to policy making bodies. So I think we can look forward to an exciting and interesting talk. So please, Sue, could you deliver your inaugural lecture entitled Bending the Arc Towards Health Equity? Thank you. I want to see you or see my notes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Vice Chancellor Professor Reddy, Dean Professor Green Thompson, my health economics colleagues, particularly Professor Sananovich, and Professor McIntyre, who surprised me today by arriving here unannounced. <laughs> I had asked her to do the closing and the thanks today online because she really doesn't like to travel so you can imagine how touched I was to see her at the ATU for the first time since 2017. Great evening to Martin to have you here Doug. Thank you. Joining me really big event my academic life and my life in general. A very special thank you also to Doug who in this morning to my husband and my daughter. Sweetie Pie, I know it's going to be so boring. <laughs> <laughs> as well as my friends and family who are here today and online, it really means a lot to me. The title of my lecture is Bending the Arc Towards Health Equity, and health equity has been the focus of my academic life. It's really not easy to move towards health equity there's a huge number of barriers and traps along the way. And so I thought I would take this opportunity of my inaugural lecture both to reflect on what I have hopefully achieved in the 23 years that I have been working here, but also to help myself to chart a course for the remainder of my career. And so I like to think of myself as mid-career. <laughs> there is slight artistic license in this because I have worked here for 23 years and I'm in my late 40s, right? So, but it's possible that if I have just a few years as emeritus professor, like RBC, I may be able to work here for another 23 years and that is certainly my intention. So I have divided my lecture into sort of three movements. The first decade is about the work I did on making the case for equitable HIV treatment, which I still consider to be some of the best work that I have ever done. But despite these successes, in the second day, decade, I did something completely different. It was quite a career limiting move actually, but I stopped working on HIV. And I would like to reflect on some of the reasons why I did that and what ended up being quite a deep dive into understanding the health system from the bottom up. And then in the third decade from approximately, so it's not really a decade, okay, so but you'll, you'll bear with me, from 2018 to date has been um, moving into a broader notion of equity um, within this, this really big idea of universal health coverage, which is the global goal but the national health insurance is where it finds expression in our country today. And then I'll try to give some thanks and make some conclusions. So, back to the first decade. I came to UCT in 1999 to do honours and then masters in economics in the School of Economics. And the 1990s, it was not a perfect decade. But there were many good things about the 1990s and we had the glow of the miracle that was a relatively peaceful transition to democracy. We had the honour of the Mandela presidency and there was much to inspire hope. But underneath all of this, a tragedy was brewing and that tragedy was the HIV epidemic. 
Part of the, of the tragedy of HIV is that it impacted prime age adults. And this graph illustrates the simple metric of life expectancy charting from 1970 to 2020. And what you'll notice is whether you look at upper middle income countries, which includes South Africa, whether you look at African countries, or whether you look globally, every single other part of the world was pretty much achieving an increase in life expectancy, except for South Africa. And we started to deviate from that path sort of really by the early 1990s. And that is a large drop in life expectancy. That is a substantial trauma that is lying behind those numbers. And as I mentioned, it was impacting prime age adults. So normally as public health people and health economists, we, we worry about the relatively young and we worry about the relatively old, but we don't tend to have to worry about adults in their 20s and their 30s. But yet here we were with this absolutely huge epidemic that was that was largely women. And of course, these women were parents. And so we had the trauma of the AIDS, uh, the, the epidemic of AIDS orphans, children who had lost one, if not both parents. And then we also had the trauma of children born HIV positive with extremely poor quality of life and extremely low life expectancy, like in Corsi Johnson, who became an AIDS activist. But it wasn't long before this trauma turned into a moral outrage because by the early 2000s, combination antiretroviral treatment had been developed and it was available in high income settings and was basically working like a miracle. It was unbelievably effective. It is unbelievably effective. But in South Africa, for one reason or another, our government was not prepared to offer antiretroviral treatment in the public health system, despite the fact that we were basically looking at about half a million deaths per annum at that time. It was, it was unbelievable and part of the reason was likely to be because of costs but we should remember that many of our political leaders were also AIDS denialists at this time i was doing my masters in economics in the school of economics and i had a master's bursary which required me to write my thesis on the economic aspects of international trade but I was keen to work on HIV treatment. I just really, really wanted to work on HIV treatment. And I understood that if cost was the barrier cited by government, working on HIV could be an opportunity to put my economics training to good use in service of the country that I love. Fortunately, I found a way to build a bridge between international trade and HIV by writing my masters on the trade related aspects of intellectual property rights which allowed me to understand the, that the role, the role of patents in driving up prices could push for generic competition to achieve quite substantial price drops. And that allowed me to get my first peer reviewed journal article and the start of an academic career was on its way. Straight after that, in October 2001, I started working in the health economics unit. And I think at the time, Leslie, we were called the Department of Public Health and Community Health Care or Community Medicine, I can't remember. But now we're called the School of Public Health. And I was hired by Professor McIntyre to be her junior research fellow. My recollection is that she gave me a pile of reports to read and then asked me to do an annotated bibliography of literature on health equity for a paper she was writing. And I remember it took me about two weeks. I, I'm not that clever. It took me about two, it wasn't that much work. It took me about two weeks to do this, and I, I may prefer to give her what I'd done, and she was a bit of a loss as to what to get me to do next. And so somehow, I can't remember how it came about. I think I managed to convince you that I should be working on HIV, actually. <laughs> and there are many things that I am thankful to die about, but one of the things is that she was amazing at at supporting junior colleagues and somehow or other um, MSF was already running uh, antiretroviral treatment in uh, pilot in Kailicha and I had friends in MSF and somehow or other we organized to have a meeting between MSF and DAI and I was in that meeting I did not understand a word, a word of what they were talking about I didn't know what, it, what was going on but DAI somehow managed to answer their questions and we left that meeting with an agreement that the health economics unit 
would lead on an evaluation of the cost effectiveness of ARVs in Kailicha. Um, as I've mentioned, there were only a handful of health economists working on HIV globally, and I knew that cost was the stated reason for our government not to provide HIV treatment, and that health economics evidence would be part of what would be needed to bend the arc towards health equity in this instance. So thank you, Di. But I also want to acknowledge another key colleague at that time, and that colleague is Andrew Bull. Nice to see you here, Andrew. I don't know where you are now. So Andrew, I think he was a junior registrar in the department, he's now a professor, but he was a junior registrar at the time. And he also was interested in working on um, the cost effectiveness of HIV treatment in Kailicha. And in the end, our work involved quite hectic Markov modeling, and certainly nobody in South Africa knew how to do that. And there was no online learning, and there were no online journals, and there was no way really to learn. But somehow or other, between the two of us, we were able to model through, and I do not think I would have been able to do it on my own. And I still remember Andrew's telephone number. I don't know. <laughs> his, I, there were no WhatsApps. I don't know his actual whatever his cell phone numbers, I have no idea, but I know what, I think it was 6715, Andrew. <laughs> so I used to phone Andrew every, no, I made two, three times a day, I'm not joking, um, as I got stuck with one variable or another. And, and again, somehow we were able to put it off. In this way, we spent a number of years working on the cost effect, on a number of cost effectiveness analyses. I think the most important in Kailicha but also looking at a clinical trial that had been conducted at Hulisca and Somerset. And once we finished that work, um, we looked at the cost effectiveness in the private sector, um, just because more evidence is always a good thing. And we looked at pure private sector patients involved in medical schemes, and we also looked at public-private partnerships for the delivery of ARVs. Um, for quite a bit of this time, government continued to drag its heels. And I remember it being an exceedingly long political battle, but I think that's because I was young, because actually it was only about three years before the government um, agreed to roll out ARVs. And it was just an amazing time. And I look back with considerable pride about the work that we did. I've told a story about my particular role but there are many others in this room, like many others in this room who also played a role in, 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 in this movement for HIV treatment. And I'd like to say that I think that what we did was spectacular. Somehow we managed to marry science and activism in a way that was truly inspiring. And we managed to bend the arc towards health equity at a crucial moment in our country's time. And it was something that we did together. After that, something that I, I remain extremely proud of, uh, another high point in my career was when I was invited by doc Dr. Mark Bletcher, Deputy Director General of Health and Social Development and National Treasury, to work with him on chairing the health economics team, working on first the, the, the first national strategic plan and then the second one. And we calculated all the budgets, everything from SDR treatment to TB preventive therapy to mass media campaigns and of course to HIV treatment. Um, and in this way, we were able to calculate the amount of money needed for the conditional grant that basically secured the rollout of ARVs. And before long, South Africa's rollout was a great success story and we had the highest number of people on antiretroviral treatment, and it remains a success, success story to this date. However, despite these successes, some cracks were starting to show. During the mid-2000s, the goal in HIV treatment was to offer universal access to ALVs for those with a CD4 less than 200. And basically, that is a measure of a person's immune function where the CD4 less than 200 means that the person is, is potentially already starting to show signs of HIV, is already starting to get sick, and is at a relatively higher risk of death. Um, we knew that it would be most cost effective to focus on this category of people, and we knew it was, would also be equitable because they had the, the highest capacity to benefit. But the problem was that even if we were to limit treatment in this way, the costs were looking extremely daunting. 
In fact, we were looking at, by about the fourth year of universal access, we were looking at one third of the public health system spending. And I'm not talking about primary health care spending. I'm talking about the whole thing, one third of the whole thing. And by year 10, it was looking really unattainable. And this was just for CD4 less than 200. In preparing for this lecture, I had a look at the paper where I reported on this, just because, you know, it's a bit of a crystal ball gazing exercise, this modeling business. And, and you wonder, you know, did you get it wrong? Did you get it right? So what I will say is that ALVs themselves have become a lot cheaper and the models of care have also become more cost effective than, than what we were using at that time. But I then looked at our projections of economic growth and we were very wrong. It, was, it has turned out to be so much worse than what we expected this. So economic growth has and continues to be dismal. So I think put together, I was right to be concerned that HIV treatment had the potential to crowd out other healthcare needs and to be concerned that some would feel that this was in fact not good for equity. And despite these concerns about the affordability in South Africa, the global discourse was shifting to further push the dial on HIV treatment with the 1990-90 targets, which were part of an ambitious plan from the UN agencies and others to end AIDS by 2030. I thought that this was alarming because this plan entailed that 90% of everyone living with HIV would know their HIV status, meaning they would be tested extremely regularly, of whom 90% would be started on treatment as soon as possible, if not immediately, of whom 90% would be su successfully treated. So this was looking at a, a far larger number of people being maintained on treatment than even what I had been concerned about already. So to try to illustrate the concern that I had is, is this figure. So the blue, the blue, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, no, you probably can't. So the blue, the blue square illustrates an annual budget, call it about 200 billion. I'm not saying that is our annual budget, but it illustrates an annual budget. And you can use that budget to purchase a certain number of, in, of interventions. And hopefully that's covering most of the key burdens of disease, but you can't have everything. And you can, if you have say 40% of the known effective interventions, maybe you're going to achieve a coverage of 70% of those in need. So that is sort of one measure of equity. So you've got about half, 40% of the known effective interventions and a 70% of those in need. Many would say, that equity means, so equity like beauty is in the eye of the beholder, meaning that different people will have a different definition of what equity means. But many would say that this picture is more equitable than the previous picture, where we're looking at say only 30% of the known effective interventions, but with a higher level of access. So 90% of those in need having access to these interventions. So many would say that this is now a more equitable picture. The problem was that what we were looking at is pretty much 100% of known effective interventions for HIV and not much for anything else. And also, I, I was involved in doing this, not everything that we were programming actually was effective. So we were programming both effective and ineffective interventions in order to uh, achieve this 90% coverage. So my work started to shift towards talking about the inequities that we were going to face from HIV treatment. And to this date, I find it really hard to be the sort of non-activist in the room, talking about equity for other things when people are often keen on equity for one particular area. And so this then brings me to the end of my story about the first decade, decade of my work in health equity. And some of the things that I learned were that health economics evidence can be powerful for advocating for investment, for bending the arc towards health equity. I also learned that views from the global north can dominate local decisions, even when one is largely spending one's own money. So only 5% of our public health system is financed through donor funding. Yet the sort of international discourse really does influence what we do. 
And another thing that I was struggling with is that I find that many seem to embrace the aspirational. But to health economists, scarcity is actually a real thing. We really do think budget constraints are real. So more and more and more for one need always means less and less and less for other needs and is bad for equity, in my opinion. So I stopped working on HIV. I've already said that that was quite bad for my career. Anyway, I'm still standing, so it's fine. <laughs> uh, I knew a lot about HIV, so it was quite a big loss, but I stopped working on HIV. And I mentioned that there was, there was a huge amount of evidence on HIV, but there was almost nothing about anything else. And so I made the decision to try to contribute to a broader evidence base through a combination of my master's, PhD and postdoc students. Um, it has been quite challenging because in order to do economic evaluations, you have to have quite deep disease specific understandings. But I was unable to do that, so I was hoping that others would be able to carry that. And so in this way, I have contributed to economic evaluations on hepatitis A and B, on type 1 and 2 diabetes, on COVID-19, pediatric pneumonia, as well as quite a substantial body of work on mental health. But I was also feeling very burnt out and disheartened by the politics of the global health movement. Because we get involved in questions of resource allocation as health economists, there's always a lot of politics. Where there's lots of money, there's lots of politics, and I was finding it all really rather depressing. So I needed to take a break and to find solace in something entirely new. And I found this by moving into an entirely new terrain of work that was being developed at the time by others like me who were also worried that a focus on disease-specific priorities was too limited was potentially bad for health equity and was decontextualized from health systems realities. And this new field was called health policy and systems research. In the end, I, um, I managed to work on a number of health systems research pro projects, but I would particularly like to highlight, highlight one, which was the RESIST Consortium, which was an international consortium funded for eight years by UK Aid. We worked in a number of Africa, African and Asian countries, and um, I would like to acknowledge the role that was played as um, research co-directors by Professor Lisa Gilson, sitting at the back there, and by Professor Cara Hansen. We did work across a number of thematic areas but I was particularly interested in questions of governance in general and was passionate about leadership and leadership development. This was quite a departure for me, as I have mentioned. I had worked on resource allocation, relatively tang tangible, but leadership is more in the realm of the intangible. You can feel it. You can feel good leadership, but it's really hard to define what that means. And more importantly, it's really hard to work out how to develop it. So we needed new methods to study concepts like leadership and governance, and we tried to capture that in this infographic that was just put together, which described our methodology of action learning. But basically what it was is we set up learning sites, one in Mitchell's Plain in Cape Town, in Sedi Beng in Gauteng, and Kalifi County in Kenya. <laughs> And the idea was that as researchers, we would get involved almost as the team working, working very much with practitioners as part of the team um, to really uh, develop contextualized understandings. This was crucial for me because uh, many of you are, are clinically trained, but I wasn't. I was an economist and I spent very little time actually within health facilities understanding daily functioning. And I remember clearly the one time that I visited one of the large community health centers in Mitchell's Plain. The facility manager took me on a tour around her facility and we ended up in her office. And in her office, she showed me this really large cabinet and inside this cabinet was a whole bunch of national policies. And she explained to me carefully how these things were completely in contradiction with one another <laughs> and totally divorced from real resource constraints on the ground. And I was obviously chastened because I had been involved in some of those and I was <laughs> I had been involved in writing the targets for some of those. And, uh, yeah. 
I realized that we, we, we basically did not know what we were talking about a lot of the time. <laughs> In effect, what she described was a toxic combination of policy incoherence and unfunded mandates and how this ultimately sets up our health workers for daily failure in that the job as written on paper is impossible to achieve in practice. And so in this way, I spent many extremely happy years actually seeking to understand the health system from the bottom up, studying things like culture and how it impacts accountability, how to enable relational leadership, how to nurture resilience in health systems, how the nature of complexities in hospitals impacts on their performance and how power is used to influence priority setting both for good and bad. So the key lessons that I learned is that global policies often hold incorrect, incorrect assumptions about functioning of the health system at the coal face. People have discretion. It's a good thing that people have discretion. So this means that they're going to reinterpret the policy to try to get it to work in a local context. Because of this, good governance and leadership is essential to everything to do with health system development. Sadly, from a health economics perspective, I learned that even if you have health economics evidence proving value for money, many healthcare needs remain unmet in absence of activism or sound policy making. So that then brings me to what the work that I have started to do in the last five approximate years, and that is now moving to a broader understanding of equity as contained within this notion of universal health coverage, which finds expression within the national health insurance in South Africa. So I had learned that focusing on disease specific priorities may not necessarily push the dial on equity. And in fact, often what it does is it means that certain areas receive more, more attention than others. Um, at the same time, the National Health Insurance is a reform that's being devised at the, at the national level. And so it does run the risk, as previously mentioned, of being very decontextualized from local priorities and, and local realities. So I think everybody knows what NHI is, so I'm going to go quickly through this. Um, but it's a wide ranging reform touching on, on just about every aspect of the South African health system with the intention of improving health equity. And the reason for this focus is summarized by <coughs> this picture, which describes inequity very broadly, where we spend about 4,800 Rand per capita on those dependent on the public health system. And as I've said, this is largely tax funded with, with donors and NGOs, yes, being there, but only up to about 5% of that funding is from donors and NGOs. At the same time, wealthier people um, are contributing to medical scheme coverage at approximately 23,000 Rand per annum. So in addition to our sense that this is inequitable, and I think that this picture plagues those of us who work in public health. So in addition to it being inequitable, there's also a lot of problems in both of these sectors and plenty of scope for improvement and actually need for attention. And the NHI is, is an idea in one way or another with different names. It's been on, on the agenda since democracy. In 2019, the NHI bill was presented to Parliament and they followed four years of debate and UCT made an input. I was involved in doing that. And then after that, in May 2023, an amended bill was adopted by Parliament. And I must express my disappointment that the amended bill is almost exactly word for word the same as the original bill. And we made constructive inputs, people. There were things that we said that were useful that would have improved it, that could have allowed us to move closer towards health equity, but no changes were made. And we're sitting at the moment waiting to see whether it's going to be approved by the president. So the NHI is the South African manifestation of this broader policy of universal health coverage, which is one of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And bear with me, it's, it's not my definition, but it is about providing all individuals and communities with access to needed promotive, preventive, resuscitative, curative, rehabilitative and palliative health services of sufficient quality to be effective 
while ensuring that the utilization of these services does not expose users to financial hardship. The goals are therefore access to quality services when, need, when in need and that there should not be financial catastrophe when using services. So leaving NHI aside for a moment, we can ask ourselves how are we already doing on UHC in South Africa looking at those two key goals. So this um, global map tries to illust illustrate some of how we're doing and it's a bit of a crude measure, but it's a measure of service co coverage and quality. And I would say we're doing okay. So we're not shooting the lights out on this one, but we're doing okay. And our performance is not that different from other upper middle income countries in Asia and South America. But when it comes to financial risk protection, we're doing really well. And this measure is a percentage of total health expenditure that is out of pocket. And here you will see that South Africa has just some of the best stats in this regard, in that it's looking at less than 10%. And I know there's some Canadians in the audience, and I, I went with a bunch of Canadians recently to, uh, to do a facility visit to Hanover Park which is one of the community health centers. And they kept asking me, where are the user fees? Where are the user fees? I'm like, no, it's free. <laughs> no, but, and then like, but no, shouldn't you have to pay for medicine? No, it's free. And then they said, but what about if you need an IUD? Don't you have to pay for that? I'm like, really? When I say it's free, it's free. And I think it's something that we should be proud of. The extent to which we've managed to pull this off um, is, is really something amazing. And I'm not saying that there's no catastrophic expenditure. I'm not saying. But another thing that I have done over the last 23 years is really detailed micro level work seeking to understand the affordability of health services to people when they use them. And we have literally interviewed thousands of like thousands, if not tens of thousands of people asking them about their transport costs, asking their, them about caregiver costs, asking them about lost income, asking them about whether they had to pay a bribe to a health worker. We never, ever, ever found a single bribe paid in all this time. Everything that you could possibly imagine, we asked them about. And we did not find much financial catastrophe. And so I do think that this is something that we can say to ourselves, we are doing well in this regard. So now to get a little bit more controversial, because why not? <laughs> And to speak to this question that you'll see in the media all the time, so is the NHI affordable? And it is an inherently unanswerable question, but I shall seek to give my <laughs> At the moment, we spend about 9.6% of GDP on healthcare, and it's split sort of 50-50 between public and private. So if we, if NHI means that everyone is to use the current public health sector at about 4,800 Rand per annum. Clearly, NHI is affordable because we'll have, we'll save resources because we'll only need 5.8% of GDP to do that. So that's what NHI means. Clearly, clearly it's affordable. But if NHI means that everyone uses the current private health sector, which is what you're definitely going to read about in some of the media, then we're looking at about 30% of GDP. And that is just not what the colleagues in the National Department of Health are proposing. But my husband said to me, why is 30% a bad number? So this is why 30% is a bad number. So, shame. The USA is, is thought of as one of the countries with the worst value for money and a really bad health system. And they're spending at about at less than 17% of GDP. Um, and then the other country there that's spending a lot as a percentage of GDP is Afghanistan. But I don't think that we're saying that that is what we want to be. So I'll come back and I'll say that if NHI means that everyone is using the private health sector. I do not think that that is the policy proposal that's sitting on the table. I do not think that that is what the colleagues in National Department of Health are talking about. Instead, it's got to be somewhere between these extremes and it entails leveraging good governance and leadership. So I still think governance and leadership is absolutely essential in order to both bend the arc towards equity with better population health outcomes. And this is a possible thing. It's factually correct to say that we can do this, 
The problem is, can we actually do this? And so some of the things that I've learned so far, um, very much emergent. Um, you know, academia, it's a long time before you can say you know anything about anything. So it's <laughs> still a new area for me. But what I would say is that this reform is extensive. It touches on just about every aspect of our health system. Some of it is like a no brainer. It's like, sure, of course, but we don't actually need an NHR to do those bits. Then there are other bits. Uh, so you know I don't like the aspirational. So there are other bits that I think are aspirational and unrealistic. And then there are other aspects that are contested and polarizing. And because of those aspects, we know that if the bill is passed, it's going to be held up in legal battles for pretty much the foreseeable future. And so my concern is that I just don't know whether we have sufficient support from health stakeholders and even National Treasury. Economists like to talk about revealed preferences, and one of the, the ways you look at that is looking at the money that's put on something. And in last year's budget, National Treasury said $9 billion over the three-year medium-term expenditure framework. And in this year's budget, they said $8.3 billion. So even National Treasury um, is, I think, wondering about the NHR. So before I try to make some conclusions, I would like to say some thank yous. Firstly, to the colleagues in the faculty that put this event together, Linda Roder and Timakazi Sonwabi, thank you for being patient with me. There's a lot of angst involved in doing an inaugural lecture, and I was definitely avoiding some of your e emails. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, the School of Public Health. So I haven't, I've spoken about my research today, and I haven't spoken about the fact that I have, about two years ago, become head of the School of Public Health. And it is an honor. I must say, I really like being the head. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. I really, really do. And so I'd like to, to thank my close team, which includes Carmen de Quirker, Lisa Marie Smith, and Asaf Brink, as well as all the heads of division. Thank you to some of you who are here today and the directors in our very large school. So we are 220 members of staff. And this is just some of us. This is a picture that we took last year when we were re sort of doing our, our vision exercise, our vision. And as I said, it, it, I, I really do love being, I know it's a very strange, but I do, I love being. And I have found it to be an honor. And you know, I, I have this thing about leadership. And so part of why I love it is it's given me a chance to see what it's like to practice what I preach. And with the pros and the cons, and of course there have been some cons, but I'm so grateful, so thank you. I then want to thank the Health Economics Unit colleagues, and so I've worked in the HU for 23 years, people. At one point I thought, no oh, man, I've got to go and work somewhere else. You cannot spend your whole life working <laughs> in one place. But my problem was there wasn't anywhere better. <laughs> and so I stayed. And what's good about that is that there's, some, there's a lot of people that I've known for a really long time who I've managed to not fight with. <laughs> and and that, that's just a, a really a lovely thing. I also want to thank my PhD students and postdocs. So a PhD is a bit of a trauma, and I hope that being supervised by me isn't more traumatizing than normal, but it might be. And so thank you to my PhD students and the postdocs who I uh, have had the privilege of learning with over many, many years and with you and because of you, I've learned a huge amount. I also want to mention my diploma in health economics students, and this is our class photo from last year. So we have, in my view, a stunning diploma in health economics <laughs> and we have a lot of students and they come from all over the health sector. And I mentioned that I am not clinically trained, and so I have a lot to learn. And part of how I learn is through engaging with these people. And it ranges from the Auditor General's office all the way to the Mutata Medicine Depot. And every year we have another person from the Mutata Medicine Depot. Right? <laughs> <laughs> kind of then I want to thank my extended family, the Clary's, Overton, Searles, Grannings, and Zimbowski's. I kind of wanted to say uh, thank you for putting up with the strange academic person, but hopefully it hasn't been too bad. 
And then I want to thank my father, mother and brother. So I have this love for South Africa and my father has a love of Africa. I really see the way that his love of Africa has contributed to my love of South Africa. But then for my mother and my brother, to you two, I want to say thank you for the way you have always had my back and always been silent. Then your turn is here, Mrs. <laughs> to my husband and my daughter. So, so firstly to my husband, you have this belief in me. <laughs> Nance and I have known each other for more than 20 years. So I know a lot of people a long time. We've known each other for more than 20 years and we have been close that whole time. And there's so many things I appreciate about you, but the way you believe in me is so good for, for my self-confidence and self-esteem that you make. I'm, I'm so much better because of having you in my life. And then, Miss Isabella, <laughs> so I'm rather old to have such a young child. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> and I know, I mean, it's terrible. I could just gush about you, Isabella, but I'll try not to. And, and it's almost like words define me. I don't know how to express what you mean to me. You just mean the world to me. And it's, it's not been easy because I was sick for a long time after you were born. But there's something about suffering, <laughs> which I did extensively for ages. <laughs> and it wasn't your fault, but it's made me a better person. So thank you to Isabella. So in conclusion, a very great man once said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. This quote inspired me for the title of my inaugural lecture, Bending the Arc Towards Health Equity. So I would like to believe that Dr. King was correct, but I'm not sure, particularly not at the moment. I see some very worrying levels of polarization globally and some truly horrendous political leadership. Again, leadership people. I wish that we could find the middle ground. That said, I would like to remind all of us here that we are a great country and that we have achieved, achieved great things. And in many ways, we are an inspiration globally, particularly for our work in healthcare. We're very insignificant economically though. <laughs> in the 1990s and early 2000s, we thought HIV would break our moral fabric apart, but we came together to speak with one voice and insisted that HIV treatment would be made available. More recently during COVID, I didn't get that much of an opportunity to work on COVID. So this is definitely not about me. So more recently during COVID, the work was spectacular. Like, there's a lot of people in this room who worked on COVID. I thought the work it did was spectacular and it really inspired me. Even in the space of UHC, where there's much contestation, we had, can be proud of what we've managed to achieve already, including the fact that almost all our services in the public health system are free at the point of use, and this sets us apart globally. As academics, I understand that our role includes knowledge creation, and often that means looking for problems in order to agitate for improvements. But for me, there has been something more important and that has been love. So more important than knowledge for me has been love. And for me, there is a love for South Africa, for my students and for my colleagues. In my view, love is the essential element that we need if we are con to continue to bend the arc towards health equity. So thank you once again for being here today. It has really meant a lot to me.
benefits um, indicated that um, I now have to invite Professor Brian McIntyre to deliver a vote of thanks virtually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to deviate from our notes. So, uh, it gives me great pleasure to invite Professor McIntyre to deliver a vote of thanks. family and friends. Um, so thanks very much to Sue for a, an incredible overview of some of the most important aspects of your work and, um, and for where you think life, your research life and work life might be going. It was great. And also thank you for the honour of, of inviting me to give this vote of thanks. I decided I would do a slideshow um, because uh, I like to have that as a support, but because Sue is seriously photogenic, so <laughs> it's really not fair. But anyway, so, so I was going to tell the same story, you know, that in one of my periods, of feeling completely overwhelmed with management and policy work and all the rest of it. Quite a few of my colleagues said, what do you need is a research assistant? <laughs> <laughs> and that was how I met Sue. Sue came along and um, that was that was over over 20 years ago. That's how we met. But uh, you reported your appointment as my research assistant. We have the same memory. It lasted about two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I just I couldn't keep up. She was so enthusiastic and efficient. And but it was very clear that Sue was going to be an outstanding independent researcher. Um, rather that than what in those horribly exploitative days was all too often essentially a gopher. Um, that you received your first kind of promotion from research assistant to fully fledged entry level lecturer. Um, <clears throat> but at that stage, I had really no clue what an amazingly well rounded and accomplished academic you were going to become. And there's so many things that I think we all have to thank you for. Uh, and it's not going to be able to, there's not going to be time to, to do justice to that. Uh, but just a few ideas. I mean, you have got to be thanked for your passion and commitment to policy relevant research. Stuff that matters and is implementable. You care deeply about people and, and social justice and your research on, on HIV AIDS really demonstrates that. And there's been quite a bit um, said about the work you did on evaluation of antiretroviral treatment at what was an incredibly difficult time in our country. Uh, and it contributed in major ways, not only to South African policy and service provision, um, but also globally through your involvement in, in some of these activities. Um, my understanding was that you had been, even who was peripherally involved in, in some of the COVID-19 work, certainly supporting some of the modelling initiatives and giving advice to, to government on um, appropriate interventions. And more recently, you've spoken about it, getting involved in um, debates around the NHI and promoting research to assist in building a sustainable universal health system. I hate the term NHI. It's not what it's about. Um, and I'm, I'm through that, that you, you put in more of your time and energy into that. Um, your your um, applied and, and it's always relevant research is 
well respected, it's valued, and it's evidenced by your participation in plenaries at, may I say, the most prestigious international <laughs> conference. <laughs> and that you've done that both virtually through, during the dark days of, of COVID, there, there was Sue at the, the 21 Congress online, and then in person uh, more recently. There are many health economics graduates around Africa who are incredibly grateful to you for your interactive teaching style. Because that really enables an understanding of concepts of methods and their application. And I know that you showed leadership in that sort of sudden flip to online teaching. And clearly it was, it was very effective. Um, I know you also as an exceptional mentor and the people who benefit most from that are your doctoral students, but also the staff around you, but your doctoral students as well. And um, you should be very proud of your doctoral students because among them you've, you've nurtured some of the absolutely rising stars in the African health economics firmament. So um, a thank you from all of your graduates. The Health Economics Unit is, is also grateful to you for your leadership in so many different ways. Um, one particular initiative I'd like to, to mention is in improving the financial sustainability of the HEU. Um, the HEU started as an entirely soft-funded research unit but we very quickly became aware of the great need um, for capacity strengthening and, and so we started the master's program through largely WHO funding and then later CEDA funding. Um, and later on, uh, developing both PhD uh, program and a postgrad diploma program with no external financial support. And I used to go around this little begging bowl and peanuts, you know, we've got soft funded researchers and they are actually helping us run these programs and please. And anyway, not our suit. Mm -mm. When she took over as director, she developed a business plan. And she worked out there, you know, to demonstrate to UCT what staff time was required to run these programs, how much revenue uh, UCT was getting from all of these, these programs. And um, yeah, I mean, what can I say? She came away with a, a new GOB funded post. <laughs> so, and I believe that um, it seems that she's actually advising others in the faculty, helping them develop business plans. <laughs> um, but Interestingly, uh, I, I spotted this the other day and I really, I sort of thought it's amazing that it's now become a broader university issue of paying some attention to how to um, compensate uh, soft funded researchers, SAFARs, um, in, their, in their teaching activities. Okay, I better move it up. Um, the School of Public Health has also got much to, to thank Sue for. And I particularly want to mention the PhD program, which she's built up into what I believe is the second largest um, after the uh, Department of Medicine in the faculty. But um, for Sue, it's not about numbers, it's about people. So how Sue went about the PhD program is just remarkable. And she introduced initiatives to support doctoral students as well as supervisors with a focus on transformation of institutional culture. Uh, these initiatives ensure that doctoral students don't feel that they are walking alone and they're able to share their coping strategies and support each other and also receive support. And in terms of um, supervisors, 
uh, she's provided opportunities to reflect on their practice and learn from each other. And as mentioned, Sue is now head of the school. Um, and I'm sure that as an economist, <laughs> she is kind of rubbing, you know, she's, yeah, she's probably butted heads with some. <laughs> she will do everything she can to ensure staying within budget. <laughs> but she's also committed to ethical priority setting practice and in a transparent way. So she will fight for a fair distribution of what are now extremely limited resources. Um, so I, I would say so apart from having the, you know, being an economist and having to behave, you know, live what you speak as an economist, do that. Um, I mean, I can only imagine that you are an excellent head of department. All too often, great academics are not cut out to being even sadly <laughs> good managers. <laughs> but you, from a very early stage, invested in the so-called soft skills. Um, and my view is that you're a role model of how to listen to others, to hear and to understand their perspective and to engage to make wise decisions and also sometimes to resolve conflict where that's needed. Something I meant to say earlier was when you when you got came away with the, the GRB post is that another characteristic of yours is a true example of being assertive. You're not aggressive, but you're very clear about very firm and you make others aware of the realities in a, in a really respectful and clear way. Um, the faculty has also, and please note this is how I see the faculty, H-E-U, there. <laughs> the faculty has also benefited from many contributions. You've, you've always been willing to, to take on a range of responsibilities and to make substantive contributions. You've served on and chaired post-grad teaching committees, as well as, I think, very importantly, various fun, fun, uh, faculty finance and financial risk management structures. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think it must be invaluable to have an economist um, actually involved in, in some of those things. And thank you, Sue, for being the economist within the faculty who stepped up to the plate. Um, so thank you, Sue, for being full of life, energetic calm, clear-minded, a listening and hearing person, assertive, aware, sensitive, committed, passionate researcher, teacher and manager. And thank you, Sue, for being a wonderful colleague, a friend and fellow adventurer on the sidelines of work meetings in far off places and an amazing spouse and mother. Thank you. Thank you. It really struck me this evening that that's the first time that I saw the Sikorsa way of saying the School of Public Health. And then inspired by Sue's delivery today, I really felt the need to say it out loud. Because <laughs> I don't think we say it out loud enough, this new way of saying things and understanding things, because I think that's what I've experienced this afternoon, Sue, is this breath of changing the, the story as you've gone along and even changing the career direction in when it perhaps it cost you, as you said. So thanks very much for that, this idea of looking at, at perhaps old problems in new ways and helping us to see them in a different way. And I think that is the gift of, of a school of public health often, is that way of looking at things differently. And I'm struck today about the, the journey from research assistant to head of school, because I think it is not an insignificant journey in, in that, in that 
bending of the arc, you yourself just have come into the center of the conversation in the faculty. So I'm really grateful for that. The other day um, in advertising this lecture, I reposted the faculty's um, um, the faculty's social media stuff. Um, and I, I pointed out in that post about just how much of a privilege it has been to lead alongside you. Because I was worrying interested in, in, in your comment Di, about assertiveness. I wasn't quite sure if there's assertiveness or tenacity. A kind of rough kind of assertiveness that makes sure nobody gets away without answering the question that's being asked. So <laughs> well that brings that brings me to you now. <laughs> It is only the tenacity that, that uh, partners often have to enjoy in this <laughs> But I want to say a particular word of thanks to you, Lance, and to Isabella that you've come this afternoon because in recognizing the journey of a woman in bending that arc over time, it often is only possible because of the people with whom they stay. The people to whom they return in the evening who continue to refuel them for what are clearly significant battles as we move this conversation around health equity. And I, I, was, I was captured as you, in that, oh, captured is the wrong word, eh? <laughs> um, I was taken by the notion. <laughs> I, was taken, I was taken by your notion of closing with that Martin Luther King uh, quotation because, in fact, it is about this idea, colleagues, of how we continue to put the question of health equity in the realm of social justice. They're almost indivisible, they are indivisible because you can't talk justice if you're not talking health equity. And in fact, in many ways, health equity itself is that enabler of justice because the closer we come to that, the more secure our hopes are of justice as we go forward. And so Sue, in closing, I want to just thank you for again in this evening just placing this, this idea of science and the academy in, in the places of, of advocacy and the idea that the HIV AIDS uh, pandemic itself has been that example of where leadership, where, where, the, where science and the academy stood in the breach of people, in, in, that, in that idea that they could stand on behalf of people. And I think we continue to see, even in the contestations that that color our lives today, the role of the science and the academy in pushing arguments of a particular type or a form and the resistance to those. So even that is, is captured in the way that we live now. I picked up, and, and, and my really closing remark is really um, the, the, the comment that Diane made about um, pushing the business plan. Um, since, since Sue has been on the DMC, I've never had so many questions asked about the budget and whether, I've only been here a short time, but still Sue's managed to ask the most difficult questions and the most probing questions. But I'm, I'm, I'm really delighted this evening that um, um, we've had your inaugural lecture and, and, and I want to thank you, I mean, I think you said it yourself and I think uh, uh, Dai said it again, this enthusiasm for leadership, this absolute commitment to this faculty in who we are, what we try to do, and most importantly, who we're trying to become, and this constant becoming. So to walk alongside enthusiastic leaders like yourself has been an absolute privilege. And so colleagues, I'm gonna invite you to refreshments upstairs. I'm gonna ask you to stand as the academic procession leaves the room.